Hello and welcome to the Nine and Fiverr podcast. My name is Roland Tanner. I am Joel McLeod. And uh, we're welcoming to, uh, to our Thursday episode this week a, a well-known uh, figure from uh, Hamilton, uh, the uh, editor, uh, a writer and all other things on the, on the, uh, the public record website and, and someone who's been holding Hamilton City Hall's feet to the fire um, with great effect, I believe, uh, in, in recent years. Uh, Joey Coleman. Joey, w- welcome back to the podcast. Pleasure to be back. And we thought what we'd do is, is, is kind of uh, have a catch up with you on, on uh, your impressions of, of uh, how the new council is doing, uh, whether there's a new tone at City Hall, whether um, you think uh, a corner has been turned and, and uh, it's all, um, it's all going to be sunshine and sailing. rainbows. Yeah, sunshine <laughs> and rainbows from here on out. Uh, whether the honeymoon period is already over or, or I mean, certainly there's been a couple of stories which, which, which we'll get into, but wh- why don't we just start off with, you know, what's your impressions of uh, the early days of this new council? It's a council that can't find its feet. It can't find direction. It's not figured out what it wants to do. It has a city manager who is acting of her own volition, violating nor- spending norms, Technically, the city manager can spend any amount under 250000 however the city manager sees fit, but there's usually controls to that. And they are getting hit by things in terms of walk-on items on the agenda coming from staff left, right, and center. And it feels like we don't know who's in control at City Hall. It appears that the city manager's in control and council's negotiating with the city manager. And so many things that, you know, we're 100 days in, but 100 days is 6% of the council term. It's not a small amount. And on so many issues, so transparency, they've passed the motion to start studying the problem. There's going to be the mayor's task force, but nobody's yet been named to the task force. Uh, staff changes, no changes yet. You've got housing and homelessness. We've got more reports coming. They decided not to move forward with hats, which there are good arguments of, of why you wouldn't go forward with hats, but this is a council that when it was election time was talking about hats as the greatest thing ever. And so people have the legitimate right to go. Your rhetoric during the campaign is not meeting your actions during the first 100 days. And that's the summary is the rhetoric has not yet been put into action. People are getting frustrated. The culture at City Hall is more toxic outside of the the horseshoe than it's ever been. In the horseshoe, when we're dealing with the councillors, while we've seen some high-profile incidents of disagreement, and we did see Ward 2 Councillor Cameron Kretsch removed from a meeting, overall, we're seeing a better decorum. We're seeing an attempt to put parliamentary procedure what we see at the Legislative Assembly and in Parliament in place at Council. And that necessarily is going to be tough to do in that part of the reason why parliamentary procedure works is because you have the party whips. And at the local level, you don't have party whips. So you're going to have to get every councillor on board with whatever you're planning to do. So again, the summary is the actions have not reflected the campaign rhetoric yeah um there are a couple of things that you, you touched upon there that i, I kind of wanted to t- dive into um one i'm gonna i'm gonna ask if if this th- there's this lack of action this kind of lack of co- of of direction we would chalk that up to the fact that there has been a bit of a turnover in this council from the previous council there are a lot of new people uh new to being at the table I'm not going to say new to municipal politics per se, but definitely new to being the ones at the at the decision making table, and part of that might be uh, getting their their feet grounded, getting a sense of, of the job and, and the responsibility and all that. And a part B to that question: uh, How much of this is due to a lack of leadership from Mayor Andrea Horvath, not being the the parliamentarian? Uh, a statesperson, if you will, to not being the one to take kind of take the reins and lead the lead the, this new council to to a, 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 an an end goal. So the first part I think is absolutely correct that you have a lot of people who are learning the role, 
and being very cautious about it. Uh, it's very easy for me uh, up in the peanut gallery, and I'm now actually in the back row of the public gallery. Uh, I can't sit in the media row right now, and we're going to end up getting to that. And I'm perfectly fine with that. Actually, I think that I'm going to stay where I am because it gives a much better perspective of the council chamber than being right up front and not seeing the audience behind me. Uh, so it's easy for me to sit up there and go, you should do this, you should do that, especially in hindsight, without the pressure of the spotlight on me. So I think that we have a group of new councillors who have been cautious. In terms of the mayor, I think, you know, I'm, I'm sensing, and I can't really point to specifics. So this is one of those great challenges of writing, is that you, when you're writing, you have to give specifics. A podcast is great because you can give this wider <laughs> color commentary. Um, <clears throat> I'm seeing foundational work that she's doing quietly. I see a good leadership when she's chairing the committees. And I see her strategically trying to keep counsel out of fights that while they're great politically, and we all feel good going that province is terrible, we still have to negotiate with the province. And I think that that's working in terms of the longer term. And I also recall that the NDP as a party has a lot of people with very strong views and she helped that caucus together well. The NDP, traditionally, that caucus was known for having people that would splinter off or be very unhappy. And so she can coalesce a coalition. And I think that's happening behind the scenes. But publicly, we have yet to see a very clear direction from the mayor of what I'm going to be watching for this spring. Uh, at some point, we should expect the mayor to do the chamber state of the city address. We should expect the mayor to name the co-chairs of the task force on transparency. And we heard good things in her inaugural speech. And my sense, especially having watched her at Queens Park when I was a national journalist and would go to Queens Park for stories related to my beat, I've seen her take that time to build a coalition, then move forward. So that sounds reasonable. It sounds reasonable, like like. Time, you know, time will tell. It's early days of new council. In terms of the actual new councillors themselves, are there any sort of individuals who've particularly stood out to you as 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 either being uh, surprisingly good, or perhaps you were you've you've seen more, some things from them that you weren't expecting, or or uh, less uh, of being less kind of prominent than you might have expected uh, them to be. So this is always a challenging question um, <laughs> in that for journalists, we're terrible for framing based upon our expectations. And you often right. hear that in horse race coverage where, you know, candidates will try very early in a leadership campaign to lower expectations. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I just frame it in that way that it's a very subjective question, but a good question because mm -hmm. it does provide people listening with some insight of what am I seeing that I wasn't see expecting? Mm -hmm. And I'll say amongst the horseshoe that uh, each one of them have had moments where I've thought their questions are very insightful. Um, the person who I think has been most interesting to watch is Mark Tadison, uh, because I'm never quite sure where he's going, but I'm, sh I'm watching and I'm seeing that old principal in him. He used to be a secondary school principal where he hears all sides. He's very open-minded, and he does his research. That's the most interesting thing about um, Mr. Tadison is that he quickly realizes when he doesn't know something, he'll be very quiet, and then he'll go do his research. He'll listen to points of view, and then when he speaks, you can hear him almost like a judge does. Point Side A made this point. Side B made this point. I read this. Here's point C. And here's my conclusion because of. So that's been interesting to watch. Um, the other one that's been interesting is Tom Jackson, who is the longest standing council member, who has been, he stepped back. He hasn't tried to domineer. He has not tried to grab the prestige appointments. Um, in fact, he's been very collegial and very happy to help the new councils. And I was expecting that he would try to assert more influence. 
but he is not. And what influence he is using is that soft power, diplomatic behind the scenes, not manipulative that I've seen at all. Um, there's uh, there's one one note that uh, I, I, you mentioned the kind of we're heading into the first 100 days of this new council. And in politics, typically the first 100 days is when you get your your good stuff done. Um, you know, like you, you can kind of get the, the big tough to sell to the public kind of uh, in, endeavors done or at least started uh, because you have so much political capital to expel on that project. It seems to me like we're now finally getting down to the business of this council. We're like this council is finally getting down to actually exercising its political capital a bit. And I'm just wondering, what, what's your take on it? It's, it's, have they wasted this 100 days? Have they wasted this their start by not taking the reins, so to speak, and saying, this is the direction we want to steer the city. This is, the, 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 this is where we want to spend that political capital, uh, such as, you know, on, sometimes you do have to pick fights with Queen's Park. Um, are they kind of squandering it by doing this muddle about routine? Yes, I think that they they need to quickly come together and do, they're planning a workshop at some future date to talk about their priorities. They need to do that in January. They need to direct staff, because staff, of course, just overwhelm them with meeting after meeting after meeting and surprise reports. They need to tell staff, here are our priorities. We're going to do a workshop. And they need to give clear direction to staff of, Here's where we want to go. And we're now at a point where there's a palatable public frustration on all political sides. And I hear it and I feel it because I've been in the council chambers and there's protesters of various political persuasions and people are quickly losing their confidence because they were expecting more. And this is getting back to that framing of expectations. This is the change council where is the change? And that is part of a challenge for this council, right? Is that the expectation was there'd be change. And we're now 100 days in, and we're hearing we're going to get a report. Um, again, we're 6% into the council term. There's plenty of time to go. But they do need to come back from the March vacation period and have a plan in place to start. Like They need to do basically their workshop between the March break and Easter, and when we're post-Easter, we need to feel that they're in a rhythm, that they're getting things done, that they're achieve they're starting to achieve results. I mean, some some of the biggest things, perhaps the biggest story of this council happened uh, literally, I think, the day or a couple of days before or around the inauguration, the the swearing in, when it was the, the province announced that it was going to throw out the urban boundary decision made by the previous council. Um, uh, timing, I believe, was completely intentional and, and carefully crafted to, to catch everybody at a time when, when the council's not actually, doesn't really even exist. Um, but I felt that, you know, in, in a, a real test for this council was how they responded to that. And my feeling is that that response has been very far too muted there were some strongly worded public statements by individual councillors um but the council as a whole with the mayor's kind of backing i don't recall making a really strong statement of that this is not acceptable we're not going to accept this we're going to do everything in our power now i mean i accept that point you made earlier about you have to work with the province um, so do you want to throw out the entire relationship on day one? But on the other side of the coin is this, this is something completely extraordinary that's happened. What are you, so we, you know, have had, we have had council vote multiple times to express their opposition. We've had council talk about how do they resist this. And, you know, one of the challenges is that, and specific to Hamilton, so the new rules allow developers to build and to run the servicing so they can build the servicing, which has traditionally been a municipal role that the municipality partially controls development by it runs its servicing pipes. The pipe tell Friday was already built on Upper Centennial. But the other thing that is that developers building servicing is not unprecedented in Hamilton. 
The Bimbrook is the result of developers building servicing where the old regional government agreed to allow the developers to build the servicing provided that the developers connected the Glanbrook landfill to the servicing, which saved the region trucking leachate from Glanbrook down to the treatment plant to be treated, it now goes into the sewer. So Hamilton historically has allowed developers to build the servicing to leapfrog their development. Binbrook, everybody that sees a map can see it's a leapfrog. So there's that element that the levers are not really there. I think Hamilton has expressed its opposition strongly, um, not as strong as, say, Mississauga did. Uh, and now where we're talking about this idea of what levers are available to the municipality, we're seeing strong zoning reform that began with the urban boundary freeze vote that's now being implemented. We are looking at a council that is trying to figure out how do they get more things approved as of right. You also have the province putting in place that under 10 units doesn't have to go to site plan. So if the city makes sure that it enables easy development within the urban boundary, the economics of development will weigh towards infill rather than sprawl. Sprawl is going to still be a luxury product. It will sell to a luxury market. But if you end up having a whole bunch of good infill, it's People may still want to have that luxury large home in the suburbs, but if urban living is attractive and affordable, you're going to have a harder time as a developer selling that suburban dream. So, well, that's um, I mean, it, time. I guess time will tell on that. I, I don't know what the. That's what I think a lot of people are hoping is going to happen. I, I'll be honest. My 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 gets a little bit more. Uh, not not as optimistic as yours might be on that one, Joey. Uh, I, I think money money talks uh, in this province on, on that front. It's always difficult when you're building in on, on gray or whatever the phrase is, gray field sites. You know, basically sites that have been built on before and building on them again. You, you, the complexity just goes up, which is part of the reason the developers want green fields, isn't it? But um, but yeah, well. <laughs> I mean, that's certainly a way they could work, but it's it's kind of accepting it's accepting that they've lost the battle before the the, the war has even begun, kind of, isn't it? It's like there's well, a lot of win, different so. there's a lot of different types of developers though. And part of what we're seeing shifting is that we're hearing the discussions on the federal level about making financing for six unit mid-rise a lot easier to get. So CMHC takes a greater risk on these six plex mid-rises, which is what it traditionally did in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you make that available and it's easy on the municipal end to build, you buy the property and you know you're going to be able to build and you know what your cost is going to be, you'll actually see a large number of real estate investors move out of house flipping, move out of house conversion, into these six units, which have a steady financial return over time. The reason why we haven't seen many of them is that they're high risk because financing has been hard to come across. CMHC has not been as willing to finance it. The municipality can block it. You could be tied up at the Ontario Land Tribunal for two, three, four years. Thus, you can't predict what your cost of construction is going to be because we don't know what cost of materials are going to and so the risk is just too high. Nobody's been doing it. Mm -hmm. And if we can eliminate a lot of those risk factors as a society and where the municipality comes in is you're going to build a six unit, three story walk up. The municipality is going to make sure that you get your permits and provide you're doing everything right. The municipality makes sure that you can build. Um, that's that's just a, gonna... a positive that's actually a positive spin on housing for for the first time in a long time, and, and I mean I, that's that's exactly the kind of development that I think both Joel and I would would say you know this yeah. province needs much more of. And yeah. it, you're right, it just yeah. stopped in the 50s and 60s. We did it until then, then we stopped. We just we've stopped. had a few in Hamilton recently, where uh, so there's a developer, a mid-sized developer who does this, and primarily in Ward One. And I think he's beginning his third one in the Kirkendall area. And the first one was going to destroy Kirkendall. You know, it was going to be the end of everything good in Hamilton. Everything always is at start. 
The second one went in um, and the, this developer had his permits to build at the same time that they were tearing up Lock Street. And so he paused his building, waited till they finished Lock Street, then resumed his building because he didn't want to add to the traffic challenges of the neighborhood. And people love that building. So where he's going right now, which is a block and a half away, all the neighbors are thrilled. And the guy next door, I've chatted with him, says, well, you know, eventually I'm going to have to downsize from my house with stairs to an apartment with no stairs. And I'm just going to move next door into this new multiplex. And then I'm going to sell this guy my property and make money. And he can build another one here. That there are, so, I mean, it, it's it's kind of my my hood now, um, uh, and um, that that there are a couple of really good uh, and sort of more intelligent development, you know, the kind of things that I've wanted to see already exist uh, in this this part of Hamilton, and that's good to see. There there and reuse of some old buildings on on uh, the old, um, uh, I guess it was some kind of factory on Dundurn. You you'll know more than me yeah. about what it precisely was that's now uh um was converted into into uh condos um yeah i mean it, it's it shows what can be done and, and to uh, you know really revitalize a neighborhood in the process so yeah more of that let's uh and it it bears repeating because we do give developers a hard time on this podcast it's not that we're anti-development goodness knows we need development um or pro smart development yeah it, it, it's it's the yeah, I mean, it, I I can't give a good review for what the province has been doing with with, with it in recent years. Um, but let's move on from that to some some other uh, issues. I mean, there was one story that kind of directly affected you in recent weeks, and that was um, the kind of draft plan that the uh, staff brought forward for how they were going to handle um, kind of well handle. Who was allowed to go to to, to uh, uh, press conferences and how media were going to be handled with the city? And I know you may be a little bit constrained about what you can say, but perhaps you could just give us a a, a summary at least. So, uh, as some of you know, I'm a Southam Fellow, which is one of the top journalism awards in the country. Been a national journalist. There's no question that I'm a journalist. I can walk into Parliament Hill. I can walk into Queens Park. In fact, the only place that I cannot conduct journalism freely is the city of Hamilton. Um, that is the only place around the world, because I've actually covered in, around the world, I've been to state dinners um, and international conferences. The only place that I've had any issue with being allowed to conduct journalism is Hamilton City Hall. So the new policy was very complexly set up um, and it is targeting me. The city manager has been very clear. She wants me out of covering city hall and that's her priority. So this is the first priority to come from the city manager's office. They spent $135,000 to build new media offices in the basement of City Hall, three-fourths the size of an NBA court. And the offices are for media that want to move in there. It's not related to covering City Hall. Um, whereas Toronto has offices that the media rents at full cost recovery that requires that they're covering City Hall. It's very clear that if you're not providing substantial coverage of City Hall, you lose the right to rent space. And that's just the rent space. The Hamilton policy said you had to rent space from the city and by renting $100 a year. So you have to take government funding to be allowed to attend press conferences. And the city manager's director of communications, Matthew Grant, was asked if he would allow outside media to attend press conferences. And he said he would not allow the New York Times to attend press conferences in the city of Hamilton because they would not meet his definition of what is media because his definition of media is you're taking funding from the city to have an office in the basement of city hall. And I have no interest in having an office, moving my office to city hall. I'm quite happy where I am. And two, I do not take government funding whatsoever. I am not in favor of government funding of journalism. I understand why many journalists believe that that is part of the future of journalism and part of the funding model is some form of government support. And briefly, there is a very good argument to be made that in Western democracies, media has traditionally been supported indirectly by government and that this is a continuation of that. 
So that was the policy. It was done with no consultation with national media groups. I was not consulted until after it was made. And then I was asked, what do you think of this policy to ban you? Um, and I mean, $135,000 was spent on this by the city manager without council approval, without telling council. And there's a lot of questions around it. Lawyers are involved. Um, as you heard at the council meeting, the Canadian Associations of Journalists has publicly come out uh, with their concerns about it. There are other organizations that are behind the scenes concerned about it. And in fact, whatever comes out of it, so we now have a third party consultant that's gonna be hired to review this. Um, I expect that it will be legally challenged by many organizations because it's the first law in Canada to regulate journalism. Is that, you know, that, that's, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be a hyperbolic on, on this podcast, but the, the idea of regulating like the government regulating journalism, dare I say it, has, has like fascistic overtones to it. I don't, I don't think anybody really is really comfortable with the, any level of government saying, you can print this, you cannot print that, and you know make sure that we, we're always smiling on the front cover uh, of the paper. It, is this, like, it, it, is this, it's, maybe you can answer not... or not, but like, do you find this as a malicious intent or is this just kind of amateur overreach of, you know, they just, I don't like that Joey Coleman always asking these difficult questions. I, just, I want him out. It's amateur overreach. It's not looking at the case law, not considering the charter, creating this really, and if you read the thing, it's extremely complex. Um, I summarized it there, but this idea that you have to take free office space from a government to be allowed to attend a press conference, um, that's a complete disconnect. You want to give your media partners free office space. That's a separate issue from allowing journalists to ask you questions at press conferences. Those are two separate issues. Um, so yeah, no, it's absolute overreach. And you even saw that where the counselors read it because one of the things in there was you have to reveal your sources. Um, oh, that's, which is, that's, that's dangerous. Sake. <laughs> that's dangerous. And the city manager like, oh no, I didn't mean it that way. And- no. But that gives you a sense of how amateur it was, was that mm -hmm. people read it that, and I didn't read it that way. I read it as related to some ongoing disputes where the city manager's office believes it's inappropriate for me to cite legal rulings directly. And they go, well, where's your sourcing? Your sourcing can't be the legal ruling, which is, no, my sourcing can be when a judge says something, Yeah, that's my sourcing. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, no, it's this very um, amateur overreach. And, you know, I lecture in communi guest lecture in communications. And if I was on the other side giving communication strategy, you've got this journalist who is completely outside of your influence, who is reader funded, who spends a deal of time reading documents and, and asks you the questions that you may not want to answer. You dodge the question, you run out the clock, you bury them in, you know, minutia, and otherwise you ignore them because um, they're not going away. And let's face it with me. Uh, we all know the history. We know that I've been assaulted twice now at City Hall, that I'm harassed on a regular basis, and I keep coming back and covering. Um, I'll share a funny story because I think it's amusing is that I get along great with the past directors of communications for the city. Um, and one of them described me as a dog. And uh, either I'm chewing a bone or I'm marking my territory. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when I was a Southam Fellow, so part of the requirement of the Southam Fellowship is you step away from your work for eight months. You're at the University of Toronto. You're in a full-time role there. And I came into Hamilton to give a guest talk at the Mohawk Journalism School. And I got off the go bus in front of City Hall. I'm an hour and a half ahead. So I go and stand at the back of the room of the council chamber just for fun. And that director of communications texts me and goes, I see that you're a dog marking the fire hydrant today. <laughs> Whereas other people are looking at like, they're looking at their agenda. Like, Is there something that Joey's here for? And I do that. Um, it, many, many of you may know of Brenda Johnson, the uh, former counselor. Mm -hmm. Brenda's also amusing. So she chairs selection committee, which is properly in closed session. But before they go in close, they have to do the open, which they start the meeting, announce why they're going in close. 
then return to open to adjourn. And I used to go to the meeting once every three months and make sure they were doing that properly. And she would, I come in and she goes, oh, you're just here to make sure that we're doing that little bit of procedure. And she goes, again, you're like a dog with a fire hydrant. It, I mean, every, I mean, the sad truth of it is, is that Hamilton is unusual in having a journalist like you also having a, 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 a decent, a still decent city newspaper. Uh, uh, and, you know, having, having lived in other cities in, in the 905 region, th- that never happens. Um, and, and yeah, it makes life more difficult for City Hall because they've got someone like you looking at what they're doing and, and being so persistent. And goodness knows Joel and I can't compete with that kind of thing because we just, you know, we're doing this as a part time and all the rest of it. We do the best we can. Um, but we, we depend on people like you to do that incredible kind of legwork that that um that is just on a whole other level uh, you know, i happily say to, to listeners you know that joey does stuff that we we do not and cannot do currently it'd be nice to one day maybe get to that point but um and cities should welcome this i know it's 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 maybe naive and stupid to expect them to welcome it but boy when you see well when you see some of the alternatives in other cities um they should welcome so, it because it's such a key part of, of, of democratic procedure. So, and you know what? Most municipalities would, and I say that sincerely, in that I regularly attend academic conferences in, with municipal leaders. I'm very fortunate to have an affiliation with one of the think tanks at York University. So I get to go to these conferences regularly wearing that South and Fellow hat. And you know, municipalities understand, most municipal local leaders understand that without a journalist that the public trusts in the council chamber who understands the community and understands municipal government, people will presume the worst of municipal government. Mm -hmm. And they need that independent coverage, but they also need it to help them be sharper and better and give them that healthy adversarial lens and healthy adversarialism is actually foundational to our democracy it's why we call it his majesty's loyal opposition in that the opposition is ultimately loyal to the crown as representation representative of us all the opposition's goal is to make the government better and be prepared to replace the government if the government fails to deliver the goods for the public it's, it's actually so, it's, a, it's a great point I used to or have made at various points over the years. You know, people say, "Well, you look at Parliament and people shouting and behaving like children." And it's like, well, if if you want to see a Parliament where everybody behaves well and and everybody is is collegial and gets along, then there are Parliaments in China, there are Parliaments in other dictatorships around the world where everybody gets along extremely well or appears to, and no one ever shouts and screams. The shouting and screaming tells you that democracy is somewhere at work, you know, uh, and it's kind of the same with, with journalism, isn't it? It's like you, the the vigorous uh, uh, and adversarial uh, aspect of it is what keeps it honest. And look, I don't go into City Hall looking for them to screw up. I'm not looking for screw ups. Uh, unfortunately, with Hamilton, literally, they happen in front of us. <laughs> That's just the reality of it. Like, I remember when the election privacy breach occurred. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah I right, was right. walking down King Street. It was like 630. I was actually going to get dinner. And I looked at my phone and I went, no. Oh, and then I went, oh, it's Hamilton. Um, I mean, I mean just privacy... remind our listeners uh, what that was which, and, and just how stupid it was. <laughs> so the city clerk failed to get the mail ballots done in time, failed to order them in time, failed to get them delivered in time, mailed them out too late for people to mail them back to the city. I mean, and already city- a cataclysmic fail- failure of the city clerk right there. Yeah, so 3,500 voters disenfranchised, and then the city clerk sent out a mass CC email, or sorry, a mass two email. So every one of those voters received an email that revealed their name, an email address to everybody else who received it, which is just terrible municipal mismanagement, but even more terrible of a privacy breach. Because if you're getting a mail ballot, 
that's private information. Mm -hmm. And it reveals a lot about you potentially. And yeah, and it went out. And uh, I mean, it was just catastrophic mismanagement. And then on election day, the polls were so badly mismanaged that Hamilton had to declare a local state of emergency to extend polling locations and waive certain requirements related to voting because the clerk had messed up voting day so much. And again, I tell you, I don't go out looking for that. I much rather on election day write the story of people voted and here's who they chose. I mean, really, you know, copying a whole bunch of emails into uh, the two field of a of a of an email. If you if you run a local kind of uh, book club, that's kind of you can maybe get away with that. You know? But if your book club has more than about ten people, I guess it's like maybe don't CC everybody. You know, like put it in the BCC field. For a city to do it, it's just unbelievably amateurish. Um, quite apart from the the very genuine privacy concerns and the rest of it. Well, let's. Uh, I was going to say that's that's a segue into our in our final story yeah. of uh, of city mismanagement, which our final story was uh, we said we're rolling sent me this uh, a story of in the Toronto sorry, in the, sorry the Spectator uh, that a city manager was caught having lunch I believe it was lunch at a James Street pub with notorious Hamilton deceased. Notorious Hamilton mob boss Pat uh, Musitano, and this is all under the umbrella of a larger invest- investigation or, or lawsuit, I should say, about toxic land dumping at a site in Watered Down. This this is this is this sounds like a like a season of The Sopranos, in my opinion. Uh, Joy, can, can you maybe just summarize it up for our, our listeners so they get they get a good sense of it? So. This is uh, one of those cases that comes up in municipal law. Every once in a while, you will have somebody who um, is willing to litigate with the city. And in litigation, you have to reveal things. You have examinations, you have affidavits, you have cross-examination. So we have Gary McHale and others that are suing the city for negligence, saying the city should have known about the toxic soil dumping at the watered down garden site, the city should have prevented it and that the city should be liable for it. Um, They are accusing the city manager who was involved in permits of various things. So, and I say various things because they're unproven and I haven't seen the exact documents. I don't wanna make a statement of accusation that is not supported by the court documents. Um, And so in there, the manager is cross-examined, is examined, and stated that, yeah, I had lunch with Pat Mistano and claimed that they were doing the lunch because Pat had questions, and they wanted to do the lunch in a public place so that it was left questionable, and they wanted to have other city staff there so it was in a public place. And of course, the spectator did a good job of noting the absurdity of this idea that you couldn't do this meeting with other city staff at City Hall, that City Hall has meeting rooms. Um, and so in this particular case, I don't know if there's any criminal wrongdoing, but there's sure the heck a public perception problem. And this is where our city hall, some people might remember the 28 Lister um, steakhouse fiasco, where the city chose a steakhouse over better, more competent bids for the public building the Lister. And I, I said at the time, I said, well, of course, staff picked a steakhouse because it's the kind of place they expect developers and lobbyists to take them for dinner. And people were like, well, that was that was a dirty shot. I'm like, no, literally, we have a culture at City Hall where staff, this is normal to them, and that the public perception doesn't matter to them. And there's a there's certain social overlaps that do occur in society. There are certain professional events that you would be at that are a dinner where you will have people on the opposite side. That happens in all professions. And that's one thing. This regular going out for lunch is inappropriate. It's wrong. You're public officials. You're held to a different standard. You should stop it. And I think that this might be the one that finally embarrasses them enough to realize they can't do this, that it may not be illegal, but it's morally wrong. 
it lowers public trust and public esteem. And I want to disclose for people to make clear that you know, when I talk about these professional events, um, I go to academic conferences. And at academic conferences, I engage with municipal officials, I engage with developers, I engage with all kinds of people that I cover. I sometimes go for dinner in Toronto with people who are developers in Hamilton. Um, I'm not a public official, but I do hold a public trust. And in those, I learned a lot from them that helps my journalism. So it's a trading off act. But again, we need to know the appropriate boundaries. We need to disclose them appropriately. And in this case, it was clearly wrong by the staff member to do this. And they always should ask them the question. This is the question that I would pose to myself, that I do pose to myself. If somebody posted a photo of me having dinner with that person or me having lunch with that person, would I be okay with somebody doing that? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is not immediately yes, then you're in the wrong. It's one of those things that, you know, lobbying gets a bad rap in the, in uh, in in politics, it's always the idea. The idea is like the lobbying is like the back room, wheeling and dealing, shenanigans that we're we're anticipating. And as somebody who's coming out of the the government world for some time now, it, it is it really isn't because like the the idea of lobbying is that it has, it, it's meant to be the the spotlight, right? And it's it's not supposed to be in the back rooms. It's actually supposed to be in boardrooms, and you have a, a little record, little literal record of, you know. Joel McLeod met with so and so on this date, at this time about this topic, um, which is again ultimately I think what in this story. But people are asking well, why couldn't, in theory, Pat Mustano do that? She said go on the record saying I went to City Hall to speak with so and so about this topic on this date and time, and like you and I would do. It's the informal. It's the informal yeah. meetings that are the dangerous ones. You know the. The stack and dose, for instance. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I'll, I'll draw yeah. for comparison to put it sort of in real world perspective. I talked about, I have a friend who I've known him for many years. He does small developments. He lives in Toronto. When I'm at UOT, we sometimes go for dinner. I don't cover him. I don't think any of his projects will ever reach a point where I would cover them in depth. Um, by comparison, in the next few weeks, I'm having coffee with people from the Chamber of Commerce at the farmer's market, just coffee, coffee with uh, various other people who are lobbying for things at Hamilton City Hall that want to talk to me about their project. And coffee at the farmer's market is as far as it goes. Uh, I think I once had a person who picked up the bill for 10 bucks in tacos at the market. Um, that would be my limit for somebody who I have to cover on a regular basis that I don't have any other relationship with. And that I think is perfectly normal. I actually would encourage politicians to regularly be meeting with people in coffee shops so that the public sees, oh, they've met with so-and-so who's a lobbyist and there was nothing on towards going on. It's a whole other thing when you're meeting at a restaurant and who's picking up the bill. Well, I think also the element in this story is the fact that it was a known like a notorious Hamilton mob boss foot in yes. the, pick up like like and I, it kind of brings me to my my the, the titillation aspect of this story in that you know for as long as I can remember Hamilton has always had the the atmosphere of a mob town it, it's you know it, it, it that you know, going back to prohibition days uh bootleggers and, and the like and I find it startling that the city hall staff just are not cognizant of that perception and they're not cognizant of a public reputation. I know maybe it might be a bit of a thumb your nose at it and, you know, we're, we're Hamilton will do what we want, but it, you know, it, it is there. And this situation does nothing to help mitigate that, that public perception, if you will. Yeah. And you know what? It starts at the top. How many council meetings have we watched and gone, that's absurd. How are these people doing it? How are, are they not aware that the cameras are there? They just don't care. They've got away with it for so long that I doubt that any of the staff, and we don't know which staff were at that meeting, uh, the spectator may have that from the affidavit and good for them for going through all of those documents. But it doesn't seem to me 
that anybody that went went, oh, geez, what you just said, what the public said is this is not some random guy that you just met who said, let's have lunch here. And this is a, a notorious person with a criminal record. Why are you meeting with him? And, you know, this defense of we met with him over lunch because we wanted to be in public instead of at City Hall doesn't wash up. And turning back to our new council, what is our new council going to do to change the culture to one where the first thing anybody at City Hall asks is, if the public knew this, would the public trust it? Instead of the public doesn't have any right to know, and if they find out, well, they can just shut up. And, you know, we go back to the Red Hill. Red Hill is a perfect example of that, that they thought they could cover it up. Coots, you know, when there was Billy, all that sewage into Coots Paradise and everybody was screaming and the RBG was like, what's going on? The city's reaction was not, oh, geez, this is bad. We should fix it. It was, this is bad. We should cover it up. You know, I like that you brought it back because uh, I was about to do the same, but brought it back kind of full circle to our, our first discussion of this episode. You know, do, do do can we put our trust in this council? I mean, they've been spinning their wheels, shuffling, you know, shuffling their feet and, and twiddling their thumbs for the first 100 days. You know, at some point, they're going to have to kind of put the put the hammer down and say, enough's enough. Times have changed. There's an, you know, maybe Andrea has to come in and say, there's a new sheriff in town, folks, and the old the old ways are not going to cut it anymore. Do you think that that's in... That's that's a possible in the future from what you've seen at the at the council table. I think it's inevitable. Um, with this council, with this council, that inevitably they're going to have to enact changes, make changes, and the longer that they wait to do it, the more problems build up that they have to deal with, and the less that they achieve before the next election. And returning back to that discussion of you use your political capital early, time's running out. And this council needs to enact changes and they need to figure out how they address this. And I want to quickly add that the staffer in the center of this controversy should not be made a scapegoat for the larger culture. And I know that that's a tough pill to swallow. Um, and in my academic studies, I spent a lot of time reading and studying past inquiries into public matters such as this, the Somali inquiry, the Toronto computer leasing inquiry, the Collingwood inquiry. And we fail to address the underlying problems when we quickly scapegoat people in the middle. And change has to come at the top and council needs to ask themselves this question. I know what my answer is and ask themselves, is this city manager the person to solve these problems and achieve solutions for us? And then from there, they need to ask the rest of the front bench, are they able to do it? And then the key directors. And the longer they take to ask these tough questions and to figure out who their team is, the less they're going to have achieved when they go back to voters in 2026. It is ultimately, I mean, again, comparing, we're drawing to a close here. There's so many other questions, I have things I want to discuss, but we don't have time. Um, but um, we've been very critical of Mariami and Ward and Burlington occasionally on, on this podcast, but, but when she came in, she, it was already clear that there was no way she could work with, with, with the city manager. It was the, 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 the there were, they were simply not on the same page it was simply a matter of whether of getting the other councillors to agree to pay the, the then city manager to no longer be the city manager um and i'm not implying any criticism of anybody there um the the that was just the story that, that happened but i mean i do think it was reasonable for a new broom council to say we have to have our own guy we have to have our own city manager who who is who's kind of our person um the city manager is for anybody who's not f f familiar with how city halls work. The city manager is is really the person with the power in many ways um, at city hall, not the council. Um, 
So it's essential that that person is working with council and not against them. Um, it's the reality of municipal government that, and this is why their contracts have buyout provisions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, going back to the Burlington 2018 change election and what happened afterwards, the city and that city manager parted. Uh, that person went on to bigger things and achieved much success there. Same with a bunch of the staff who below as well were replaced. And that's the nature of these positions. It's the nature of government. Um, and then we look at, you know, I think one of the things that I thought was interesting, and I, we could have a whole discussion about it, so I'll keep it short. Uh, I have pros and cons on it, um, where the mayor and this council in Burlington all reelected, set up portfolios, this idea of deputy mayor for portfolio. And that is an interesting way of coalescing a team. And it's going to be interesting to see where that goes. And I'm watching that for potentially a paper I'll write, because I like writing papers on municipal government. You're going to start seeing those coming this fall. Because I, it's a fairly unique way of managing a council in comparison to, say, Toronto, where you have the strong mayor, and Mayor Tory has his executive committee, and then he excludes the rest of council. You know it's interesting. It, well, yeah, but let's not get into right, that. I think I think we're going to call it, a, call it a, a night on the on this one. You can bring me yeah. back for that one. We, yeah, yeah, well, let's do that. We'll make a do. date. Yeah. We'll put a pin yeah. in it. Thanks very much, uh, Joey, for taking the time to uh, to come on and uh, on uh, on Hamilton. Uh, all the best to you, and good luck to you and your endeavors. Thank you. Thank that's it for this episode of the 905er thank you for listening as always you can send us your feedback thoughts and concerns or ideas for future episodes to our email info at 905er.ca we'd love to hear from you you can help us keep the 905er going by financially supporting us through patreon as well as paypal visit us at 905er.ca and click on the support tab as well links are in the show notes for your convenience Lastly, you can find us on social media. Search for the underscore 905er on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So long for now. See you next time. to make the most out of this life and optimize your personal wellness then check out the natural man podcast join me host mike c as we explore all areas of human wellness physical mental and emotional learn strategies to optimize your own well-being and be in the driver's seat of your own health remember your doctor works for you learn biohacks neurohacks ways to improve sleep and ways to optimize your body and your mind. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, the Fountain app, and at naturalmanpodcast.com.